Sony's The Legend of Dragoon for the PS1 circa 2000. And fuck no, the title has nothing to do with Sega's Panzer Dragoon franchise, period. Before we get into yet another mind-blowing, albeit uproarious review, I'm dedicating this to Brookline Interactive Group, Somerville Media Center, High Energy Vintage, Disaster Peace Theater, Boston 8-Bit, Boston Open Screen, Weird Local Productions, Triple E Productions, James Rolfe, Kieran Fallon, and Justin Silverman from Cine Massacre, Darman Studios, Jay Shetty, Life Lessons with Lewis, Vid Chronicles, Soul Snack, RLS Studios, Nerd Caliber, Brentle Floss, Anime Boston, Magfest, PAX East, Too Many Games in Oaks, Pennsylvania, AAC, Another Anime Convention, Jupiter Hall and Neon Bomb in Manchester, New Hampshire, ETU Animated Stories, MSA, My Story Animated, Women in Film and Video, New England, Biju Mike, Daisy Alicia from Waltham and Abroad, and finally, if she's watching this, to the Shin Dep, Kim Tran from Wakefield, Rhode Island, this is for you, Bon Chung. Anyways, with all that shit settled, onto this game's overly linear, yet rather muddled premise. It revolves around Dartfeld, whom of course we'll see in a while, who just returned home to Celis from a five-year-long journey to search for a monster that did away with his parents during his childhood, and thereby laying waste to his birth city, specifically Neat. During his trip back, he's assaulted by a mantis-like dragon by the name of Therabrand, which of course is controlled by the Sandora Rebel faction during the Serdian Civil War, but is eventually rescued by Rose, the latter two of whom we'll see eventually also, who with Dart end up parting ways. Upon arriving in the aforementioned Celis, Dart finds out that it's been laid to waste by the very same Sandora Empire, whose treaty with Basil, hence one of their neighboring kingdoms, was broken. And to make matters worse, his childhood friend and later love interest, which believe me, I wish I had more of, Shayna, or Shauna if most prefer, has been targeted for unknown reasons, specifically the special ability she possesses, and held captive at Helena Prison. Now Dart's out to save her sweet ass, with the help of various allied characters, whose names I'm in no position to reveal at this point until later. Great Commander, this way. So, this is her. Today. Is this really necessary? It is His Majesty, Emperor Dole's command, to take that girl into custody. What's more, where Dart and Shayna hail from, and the numerous other fledgling fighters he encounters, is part of four countries that make up the continent of Endiness. Sergio, Tiberoa, Miel Sasso, and Gloriano, followed by two top-secret settings yet to be revealed in a world where ancient half-dragon warriors by the name of Dragoons, which again, has jack shit to do with Sega's Panzer Dragoon, exist through their own campaign that's been on the rise for 11 straight millenniums to topple and exterminate the shit out of an oppressive evil force hell-bent on conquering and laying waste to it.
Regarding the whole nuts and bolts, yet at times advanced, gameplay aspect, as blatant an opening understatement as this is, it's definitely not your average ass mother goddamn fucking JRPG. Upon starting, you're in control of Dart following a brief confrontation with the aforementioned Fairbrand and Celis, after being spared by the earlier featured Rose, whom you'll run into again later. Venturing through more than just his already conquered and raided home village, not only conversing with the surviving townsfolk and optionally a few of the kids, but also stocking up on necessary items, even if you have to pillage and loot, and most importantly, getting a feel for this game's unique-ass battle system, which of course I'll get into eventually. Also, there's numerous dungeons, forests, towns, and kingdoms throughout not only Sertio, hence this current first disc I'm fucking with, but also in Tiberoa, hence disc 2, Milsoso on disc 3, and Gloriano on disc 4. You're bound to traverse and explore, whether by Dart's lonesome, yeah, story of my life, right? Or with a select, diverse cast of heroes and heroines alike. In terms of control, both the normal D-pad and the left analog stick force Dart to stroll and haul ass wherever, with the latter being performed by holding circle, and even select any choice in any menu. X confirms any selection, takes any field action upon instant prompting, or forces the dialogue to advance. Triangle brings up the menu to access your party status, use certain items, equip weapons, and even save, as long as you're near the illuminating save point, like the Final Fantasy titles, obviously, among a few basic actions. Circle exits out of the menu or cancels any dialogue, especially resource shopping lists. Square does fuck all, L1 and or R1 toggles the indicators above your character's avatar regarding the distance between him and the chances of nearby or faraway enemy confrontations, as well as possible paths to numerous continuing areas or buildings in every exterior field. And of course, L2 and or R2 shifts the map view above and below while traveling from one civilization, cave, dungeon, etc. to another, during which L1 and or R1 rotates the map, and you can even shift the camera positions during battle with these very same shoulder buttons. Whenever you roam these fields, the multicolored indicator above Dart warns you of these aforementioned enemy confrontations. For instance, blue meaning all's normal for now, yellow meaning be prepared at all costs cause it's gonna go down, and red... Yeah, who could have guessed? The shit really fucking goes down, and goddamn does it really go down! At which point the confrontations ensue. During these random enemy confrontations, and even the mandatory boss confrontations, your main character can attack, specifically perform any addition by timing the push of the indicated button on screen. Double flash. Most commonly X, when the larger rotating square overlays itself precisely in front of the other, but whatever you do, don't pull it off too early or late, otherwise the resulting damage output of your addition attacks and or combos will turn out impuissant, lackadaisical, and awkward as shit, like here for instance. <laughs> Are you serious? That's it? Volcano! Yeah, who's my bitch now? Hey, yeah, that's the ticket. Are you fucking kidding me right now? Yeah, that's right, go fuck yourself. Whip smack. Go into a cave and fuck Gollum for all I care, douchebag. Christ, so close. Well, at least that was a suitable effort. In other cases, when the overlaying square turns red or orange, especially if you nailed your first edition technique timing exercise, the enemy you're facing will end up countering, at which point you'll then push another indicated on screen button, most commonly circle, and then X either once or twice more depending on the patterns, or maybe more than that. Otherwise, you'll end up taking damage as a result of deliberately failing, or more to the point, half assing the technique. Ah, ah. Oh, God damn it, so close! More additions are added depending on how often your characters perform them and how flawlessly they're pulled off, and since there's no surefire way of testing everyone else's techniques besides darts, not to mention how varied their speeds are in terms of strike timing, you're best off experimenting with each and every one of them, except for Shayna and Miranda, of course. Yes. Burning rush. 
Also, Spirit Points, or SP for short, are gained every time these addition techniques are not only performed, but also mastered, thereby gaining the ability to transform into a Dragoon upon accumulating 100 of them, as well as access to extra attacks and magic incantations, but more on that later. Regarding the other commands, as typical of every RPG, including the Dragoon Transformation ability and the special, during which the entire party transforms into Dragoons, not just Dart himself, or to a more prominent degree, Rose, that is if all have their SP meters maxed out, you can force your party character to guard from enemy attacks, thereby reducing the opposition's damage output by half, and partly healing themselves in the process. Use key items including healing potions, cures for serious conditions, including the Angel's Prayer, to resurrect a deceased party member by half their maximum health, the Body Purifier to reverse effects such as Poison, Stun, and Arm Blocks, Mind Purifier to reverse mental effects including Confusion, Fear, and Dispiritedness, the Depetrifier to recover a petrified party member and others, Sun Rhapsody and Moon Serenade to restore magic points, magic weapons, just rapidly tap X to boost their damage output upon launching, several of which include the Fire-based Burnout, the Electric-based Sparknet, the Wind-based Spinning Gale, the Earth-based Pellet, Black Rain, not to be confused with that Michael Douglas Yakuza film, Dancing Gray, Fatal Blizzard, Flash Hall, Gravity Grabber, Meteor Fall, Midnight Terror, Night Raid, Panic Bell, Poison Needle, Psych Bomb, Brave Twister, Satchet, Spear Frost, Spectral Flash, and Total Vanishing, oh, and some of which also carry light and dark properties, not just fire and water and electric and everything else, and the like, and even run away from random battles, but not during mandatory boss battles. For the record, the Charm Potion can be used outside of battle to temporarily avoid all enemy encounters, akin to the Repel items in Pokémon. Should one character and or an entire party of characters get their asses handed to them in one fell swoop, it's an instant game over, but you can continue from your previous designated save point as long as you made the effort to save in advance, depending on how much data your memory card has remaining. In regards to the chapter-by-chapter -chapter itinerary, intermingled with the cast of allies and adversaries introduced, you start off in the earlier indicated ruined village of Celis, located south of Sertio, and as mentioned before, that mantis like dragon fucks the inferior brand races hell on Dart until Rose comes to his aid, following which he, hence the character you control, Dart, confronts the Sertian Imperial Army and makes them his bitches while conversing with the fallen villagers and eventually coming face-to-face -face with the hard-assed, hard-armored army commander. <laughs> An optional battle practice tutorial with Master Taskman to double check your familiarity with the battle system and its rudimentary aspects before taking off. Oh, and don't forget about the collectible Stardust for an important task, and even an optional hidden boss confrontation, with the first being found near one of the tombstones at the far upper left corner. <laughs> meeting with a merchant in the middle of the creature-inhabited fields to find out about every key item and all the special elements, also optional, and you're free to trade some Stardust with him and or other merchants. And additionally, where you can gain extra experience and spirit points upon facing and taking down the bird-like assassin cocks, berserker mice, goblins, and the strong-ass living trees referred to as Trents. The dreaded Helena prison, where not only Shane is being held captive, the chivalrous, overly confident Lavitz Lambert of Vale is introduced. Hence where not only is your first ally assigned, but also where that often rumored in-game romance with Dart kicks in. I mean, shit, Cloud and Barrett much? While taking on all the prison wardens, both original and senior, and eventually the head of Helena, Frugal, whom we'll run into again, by the way. Throughout the prairie and the limestone cave, more monsters roam both scenes, with the former revealing more backstory detailing Dark's fucked up past, including but not limited to the crescent bees, mantises, moles, vampire kiwis, evil spiders, orcs, slimes, screaming bats, and those bastard ass ugly balloons. Go! <laughs> Volcano! Yeah, more like a pussy balloon. 
leading up to the massive snake-like Ouroboros that spits out poisonous acid and smoke, against which it's mandatory to guard your party in order to avoid being severely poisoned or worse, being disabled of any physical attacks. Paying a visit to the Indel's castle capital of Bale, where King Albert resides, and so does Lavitz, hence the former being his superior, to do much more than stock up on items, if again necessary, but also visit a painter's house to have his portrait illustrated, chat with a random mom, Martel, whom you not only accidentally run into with a crying infant child in tow, but will also award you an item if you've rounded up enough stardust, tend to be precise. <laughs> And most importantly, decide whether or not Shane is right for Lavitz or Dart through one of many heart-pounding dialogue choices. and visit the actual castle of Indels to pillage and loot and even meet up with the king himself and his trusted minister Noyce to formulate the rest of their plans to keep the Sertians off their asses. The fortress-like hoax, where an ally of Lavitz, Kaiser, is introduced, and where Shayna decides to be excluded from any further battles due to how dangerous and intense they are for her, but regardless of that, even more shit escalates there. And where confrontations against the ninja like Sandora Elite and the ruthless, not to be fucked with Giganto, Kongol, and Sue. Oh. Followed by the long awaited return of Rose as she finally joins Dart's party, and most importantly, where, get this, Dart's innermost Dragoon transformation ability is established. Even more Sandora soldiers and miscellaneous aggressive creatures will also appear in the marshlands outside Hoax, on the way to the 7th Fort of Basil, featuring even the return of that devious-ass commander, or to be more precise, a carbon copy of that hard-armored son of a bitch. Volcano Galoot, featuring a host of fire elemental creatures such as the Fire Spirits, Red Hots, and Salamanders, not to mention the Nest of Dragon, inhabited by half-raptor pelicans referred to as Runfasts, Tricky Bats, Lizardmen, Mandrakes, and the Man-Eating Buds, plus Lohan and Kazas to close out Chapter 1, filled to the brim with even more unexpected trials and tribulations, and as mentioned before, the other three earlier-sided continents are featured on each of the remaining three discs, Tiberoa, Milsaso, and Gloriano, and over time, you'll run into those quote-unquote miscellaneous allies, some of whom include Congo from earlier, who eventually switches sides following your second confrontation in Kazas. The aforementioned King Albert of Sertio and Basil, who ends up taking Lavitz's place following his death, and is a hell of a lot swifter and more intelligent. Hashel, the Elder Master of the Rouge School of Martial Arts, with a raging intent on finding his lost daughter. <laughs> the bubbly, carefree, wingly dancer, Miru, voiced in English by Lucy Key of DOA 2 fame, and yeah, she voiced Kasumi, I shit you not, and in Japanese by the late Tomoko Kawakami, hailing from the Flower City Dona and the more reliable secondary archer slash healer, Miranda from Mil Sasso. Through them, expect a diverse range of personalities, emotions, tension, mood variable dialogue, involving but definitely not limited to humor, and everything else in between, which of course, defy the ever-loving fuck out of even the Final Fantasy franchise. I'm looking at you 7, 8, 9, 10, 10, 2, 11, 12, 13, and onward. <laughs> Also, don't get me started about the goddamn boss confrontations, which, for the record, is where strategy diversification is a huge plus, not just Frugal and Helena, and the dreaded Eurobolus in the Limestone Cave before Bale, but also the menacing living statue of Arage, and the Firebird at Volcano Volude, 
followed by Graham, who was once part of Basil's second knighthood until he threw everyone under the bus, brutally murdered Lavitz's dad, Servi, and was consumed by the power of the Jade Dragon's Dragoon Spirit, and one of Darth's sworn adversaries, the very same Farabrand from earlier in the Nest of Dragon, the infamous Drake the Bandit, and the Shrine of Shirley via an alternate path outside the Nest of Dragon, packed with a shitload of traps including rolling bombs and a near-impenetrable metallic wire barrier, after which the trio is greeted by the poltergeist of Shirley herself, a former Dragoon who awards them with Shayna, and later Miranda's intended White Silver Dragoon Spirit Orb upon overcoming her through a mental challenge where she questions them over their intended aims, and shifts her shape into familiar characters as a sign of refreshing their respective memories, specifically to the aforementioned Shayna towards Dart, and even King Albert in front of Lavitz, before changing back to herself, especially in front of Rose. The earth efficient behemoth Giango back at Helena before facing Frugal again, this time alongside his two pets, Rodriguez the avian bird and Guftas the demon dog. Guftas! Attack! And even the Serdian Imperial Army leader himself, motherfucking Emperor Dolan Kazas, after taking on Kongol one last time. Seriously, I can go on for hours and hours about these bastards and never exhaust myself even once! Unless you're proficient enough in the addition techniques, as well as the element-based weapons that serve as strengths against those of opposite elements, fire, water, light, dark, wind, earth, thunder, you know, your basic rock, paper, scissors shit, during every random and advanced enemy confrontation and or important, inescapable boss confrontation, whether in human form or as a dragoon, they will all yank your fucking sack off like a paper towel, wipe their asses clean with it, and throw it in a vat of acid. In fact, fuck no, even worse, they'll slit your goddamn throat and watch the combined diarrhea and dust mixtures come out while they have you traveling on an endless, vomit-filled slip and slide over a ruptured septic tank in Lucifer's robber room! Okay, that was a rather uncalled for metaphor, and I admit I went too far on that one, but my point should be clear regarding what's to be expected in Dart's never-ending quest to avenge his already deceased parents, and track down and annihilate the hate-fucking shit out of the mysterious hooded pissants who's hellbent on stealing all the moon gems to conquer and obliterate the world, hence that earlier recounted evil force, amongst other endeavors, which of course, he sure as fuck can't accomplish alone. Again, story of my goddamn life, right? At least the rudimentary controls are adequate and manageable at best. Despite how often they'll give you an irreversible as dick case of the red ass, every time you attempt and half-ass the addition techniques in combat, timing and precision-wise, not to mention how often you'll see the distance indicator change color whenever Dark travels around anywhere, especially in the fucking caves, dungeons, and fortresses prior to being sucked into any random-ass adversary confrontation, and the turquoise path indicators, which of course are minor conveniences, yet at times, and forgive any skill shaming, either helpful for beginners or pointless for veterans, and the item usage slash conservation balances during or outside of combat. Not only that, the gameplay framework, while repetitive as a child's attention span and nauseating as a typical ass parental and or older sibling lecture, is anything but an absolute godforsaken fest. Not gonna lie, no ifs, ands, buts, or maybes there. Challenge-wise, in comparison to various other JRPGs, The Legend of Dragoon is on about the same plateau, hard yet fair as every drill sergeant and authoritative figure in history, fictional or otherwise. I'm looking at you, General Patton, rest in peace, George C. Scott, and especially you, Lieutenant Colonel Aramaki from Ghost in the Shell. <laughs> Whenever the new addition techniques are introduced, it's more than just mastering them and reaching every new plateau imaginable, it's ensuring total focus and precision, which, by the way, will piss off many a beginner and or veteran time after time, as is done with yours truly even before making this review, especially when attempting to nail Rosa's Whip Smack, Lavitz's Rod Typhoon, and many other advanced additions. So I'd refer back to what I pointed out regarding the resulting damage output consequences in case you fuck up. Ah, ah, that's... Rod Typhoon! 
Getting back to the Dragoon abilities, following your first battle against Kongol and Hoax, right when Rose arrives, she'll not only reveal the gems she uses to transform, but Dart does the same as well as he manages to better comprehend how these abilities are executed in combat. After yet another optional, yet mandatory, tutorial, these abilities are enabled when Dart, Rose, and other characters reach 100 SP, at which juncture they can transform, whose sequences can either be fully showcased or shortened mid-combat for the sake of time constraints via the configuration panel in the menu, and execute either an addition technique or cast a magic incantation, as long as that transformed character has enough MP. Also, when transformed, if you pull off a single attack or magic depending on how much SP you've got remaining, your transformed character in question will end up morphing back to normal should he or she run out. Regarding the former, the Dragoon dial will pop up before the addition technique is executed. Just simply push X to activate the dial, and tap it every time the light rotates around the pin to admit its energy, with a maximum being 5. And what's more, the overall output of your attack depends on the amount of times the button was tapped upon the light's collision with the dial pin, if at least a centimeter away from it, with less resulting in a shitty output, and more resulting in an extremely impactful output. Yeah. The latter allows the transformed character, depending on his or her element, to cast any powerful incantation of magic. Fire for Dart, Dark for Rose, Light for Shane and Miranda, Earth for Kongol, Winds for Lavitz and King Albert, Thunder for Hashel, and Water for Meru. But only one of these commands, depending on how much SP the character has, yet again, can be executed before morphing back to normal, so I'd make the wisest decision possible if I were you. In addition, once more, no pun intended, when activating the special, which, yet again, only works if all the party characters have their SP and their current Dragoon levels maxed out, the character that initiates it gets an elemental dimension, complete with perfect attack outputs and a 50% status power enhancement pertaining to the character's element. Oh, and one other thing to note, most of the dungeons and caves, while a select few seem straightforward at the beginning to navigate around, others will test your perception beyond all logic, imagination, you name it. I'm looking at you, Helena Prison, Limestone Cave, Volcano Valud, Shrine of Shirley, Kazas, the Barons in Tiberoa, the Valley of Corrupted Gravity, Home of Gigantos, Lydiera, the Undersea Cavern and its Prison Island, Fueno, and Milsaso, the Evergreen Forest, Cadessa, Mountain of the Mortal Dragon, and the Kashua Glacier, and finally for Gloriano, the half-buried glacier-covered Tower of Flanvel, the Snowfield and nearby Fort Magrid, Velweb, Zanabatos, Olara and the Death Frontier, Mayfill, Rouge and Aglis in the Broken Islands, and remember those two top secret settings I mentioned? The Divine Tree and finally the Moon That Never Wanes, within which the game's subplots and mysteries are resolved. Not to mention all the magical dreams and faded dramas cooked up by Loci, the genius of the tree, which of course you can't get the fuck out of regarding the former. And in the latter case, there's a lot of personal battles that play out, which I'd experience for myself if I were you, including but leading up to the final confrontation with the Blank Monster, the same one that made Dart's parents its bitches prior to this game's events, of course. And while we're at it, although the Stardust side quest is optional, there are certain areas within which most of them are hidden, but others can be a pain in the ass to track down and can throw off many a curious explorer at times, most notably in Bale through that nearly impossible to reach basement opposite a house's room after opening the boat dock gates with the turn of their wheel at Indel's castle and traveling via boat from the very same dock, past the underground path with the drunkard for whom he can buy the good spirits at the nearby inn, within the 7th fort to the east of Volcano Volude, past the marshlands, upon making all those shithead Serdian soldiers and their douchebag commander your eternal bitches for life, and even some in Lohan, Kazas, and even Fletz, though now, Twin Castle, the home of Gigantos, and more in Chapter 2. From what I've gathered thus far, collecting all 50 of them unlocks one of many bonus boss confrontations against the non-elemental magician Faust, plus various other mysterious dick faces, including the Polter Armor, with the Polter Sword and Helm in Fort Magrid, Sayuvale, Damia, Belzac, and Kansas, not to be confused with the state mind everyone, except not having an S before the A for the record, and Velweb upon transporting via the flying creature Kulan, created by the intelligent Wingly Savan, and even the spirits of already vanquished monsters, for the sake of building up more experience, acquiring better items and weapons, and learning more techniques and incantations, especially as a Dragoon. <laughs> was also a massive disadvantageous buzzkill, whenever you desired to backtrack to any previous continent, in case you ended up overlooking anything important, you'd have to switch this every goddamn time, like every 32-bit and 64-bit JRPG in history, not counting N64 since they're cartridge-based, I'm looking at you Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, to name a few, that is, unless you've been religiously following said side quests from the get-go. 
Other than everything else, and for the last time, since this is a JRPG we're dealing with, amongst many others I've been fucking with even long before now, please refer back to what I discussed about the save points, since I can't stress enough how important it is to do so prior to every intense situation during which the shit hits the fucking fan in a way no one's ever imagined. Jesus Christ, piss drinking, crash dude, and vodka juicing, and a weapon cup spewing, motherfucking damn it! <laughs> Graphically, taking into utmost consideration how dreadfully this game aged, or gracefully in the eyes of the opposite audience, given the console's limitations, every presentation aspect is rather brilliant and meticulous, from the participating cinematic, full-motion video CGI sequences to the fused pre-rendered and polygonal in-game elements, namely all the backgrounds, foregrounds, and the opposing subjects alike. Then again, that's to be expected out of any PS1 game ever. While all of the main and supporting characters look rather serrated and a trifle hokey, ditto for the aforementioned opposing antagonists, they're at least suitable enough considering the liberties Sony's already defunct Japan Studio team had to take with them based on what Kenichi Iwata and Hirohiko Ioku set in motion for all the other designers. There's even an always mind-blowing, contrasting gamut of perspective views applied to every exterior and interior environment alike, wherever dark roams, and where every supporting and or opposing character engages, a few including the basic fixed overhead views and fixed straight-ahead views, and even how the viewer barely notices the perspective tricks whenever these characters roam around while looking miniaturized, even if they're not properly executed. Once again, looking at you Final Fantasy 7, 8, and 9, not to mention every 32-bit and 64-bit blockbuster and or shockfest out there. Despite how choppy and oafish the frame rate is during the battle scenes, not to mention the Dragon transformation, addition techniques, the magic casting sequences, most notably Dart's own incantations, specifically the flame shot, explosion, final burst, and the red eyed dragon, and those of other characters, and even the elemental dimension sequences, at least the visuals kick far too much ass in every aspect, including but not limited to the interior and exterior backgrounds during combat, as well as the lighting and or darkness contrasts applied to said backgrounds, even with the opposing characters being exposed to these contrasts as they act out their fights, hue-wise. Moreover, how can anyone even go wrong with the lively attitudes of the minor enemy creatures or how menacing the other enemies and bosses are, right? In terms of music and sound, orchestrated by Dennis Martin, originally from the Big Apple, of course, responsible for providing music for numerous Japanese-produced shows, alongside the late Takeo Maratsu, may God rest his soul, of the Jumping Flash franchise, including Robert Mondu, and Activision and Sony's Covert Ops Nuclear Dawn, aka Chase the Express fame, known for various anime shows and films including Violence Jack, and was a former member of Konami's ensemble Twin Amadeus, who composed Beat Mania 2DX, featuring Baltimore singer-slash-songwriter Elsa Cornish, aka Elsa Raven, not to be confused with the late Elsa Rabinowitz, aka the Clock Tower donation lady from the first Back to the Future, may God rest her also, for the game's second opening theme, If You Still Believe, with Martin also serving as composer, also heard in its entirety at the very end. The majority of the instrumentally devised themes contain an undeniably diverse sense of variety between each incident, but why the fuck even stop there? While one chapter is accompanied by a multitude of differentiating songs, the other three may retain a select number of the very same, but make no goddamn mistake, at least there's a hell of a lot more choices during these story-laden instances, when exploring every civilization or labyrinthine locale, and when facing every opposing jackass, whether human, creature, otherworldly being, poltergeist, you name it, running the goddamn gamut from high energy, upbeat, triumphant, edgy, and epic, to ethereal, serene, and carefree, and everything in between, Furthermore, as overdone and constant as the near-realistic sound effects are, they're at least fitting and on the button for each and every in-game instance, while, and yet again, as expected of every PS1 game of the era, the voice acting is a mixed bag, not that all of them suck ass in the least, except maybe when every Dragoon warrior calls out their normal addition technique and or Dragoon techniques, magic, and the like, which, not surprisingly, gets excessively monotonous after a while. Push! Push! Die! More and more! Rose Storm! Big Dog! Double Snap! Yes! Ha! Burning Rush! However, what we really get is the spawning of destruction and fear that is the Black Monster. Black Monster! Yes! Yeah. Spinning King! 
is not your concern. And before I go any further, take note of my top 20 sons displayed here with five honorable mentions included down below. Regarding the replayability, needless as fuck to say, up until, say, 14 years ago, I was skeptical and uncertain over what to expect of this RPG, but considering everything it takes to comprehend, grasp, and embrace all that it has to offer, from the immensely Herculean pillars of effort and grinding your ass off to advance the stats of every party character, to the honest, edgy, and lighthearted, or more to the point mood-varied, plethora of backstories and subplots it provides, apart from Dart's main objective, not to mention the bonus content stemming from the side quests he partakes in, most notably the Stardust Scavenger Hunts, and the Dragoon Spirit Artifact, acquired upon meeting the poltergeist of Launce's deceased dragoons, or those on the verge of quote-unquote shuffling off their mortal coils, and passing them on to other potential living warriors. In spite of the commonly deliberated downsides the game has, which for the sake of everyone's sanity, mine included of course, there's no way of Ranker's gigantic ass of recapping any of them. Be prepared, and then some, to waste a fucking gargantuan as all get out chunk of your life, say approximately 2 to 3 days tops, if you're more than willing, stalwart, and patient enough to revel in and relive like never before the immortal, incomparable Legend of Dragoon.
for my final verdict thus far, it should be obvious why this, yet another criminally overlooked, albeit abundantly praised JRPG, was considered the quintessential black sheep of the genre, as it never attained the respect and or acclaim it deserved like all the rest, as it took three painstaking years to complete, development-wise, thanks to the combined efforts of more than 100 Japan Studio team members, under the deft, unswerving direction of Yasuyuki Hasebe, I might add, and notwithstanding the fact that there was a potential sequel in the works, according to producer Shuge Yoshida, it was tragically cancelled during production due to all the members shifting their focus on other developing projects at that time. Like, ain't that a bitch? Mega Man Legends 3 much? Also, consider me one of many fans that have been clamoring and groping over said potentially yet halted out of nowhere sequel. In addition, there was even a Japan-only Famitsu Bunko novelization by Hironari Izuno and an Interbrain manga adaptation by Ataru Kajiva, or Kajiba, of Zelda A Link to the Past and Link's Awakening fame, and even action figures promoting the game by the supposedly ill-fated BBI toys, which I'm guessing are the reasons why it sold reasonably well at that time. No pun intended, of course. Even making the greatest hits lineup, but I humbly digress. Either way, if you're seeking an exhilarating, deeply rooted, intense, and out-of-this-world change of pace in an RPG like nothing else, rough with an immensely exceptional and convincing, albeit arbitrary a speed-dating plotline, relatable distinctive characters, an intuitive yet overly demanding gameplay framework, and a vast diverse soundtrack that puts even Takahara Ishimoto and Yoko Shimomura to shame, with highly endearing apologies to both composers and their dedicated longtime fans in advance. Look no further than The Legend of Dragoon, as it'll run you nearly 54 to 155 big ones nowadays, while in the case of the infamous Greatest Hits variants, 48 to 123 bucks, 16 to 30 bucks for loose chapter-based discs in case you wish to replace what you accidentally lost or what's already damaged, or a measly ass 6 bucks on the PS network. Also, allow me to take this last-minute opportunity and assure everyone that there should be no ounce of lament in experiencing what it has to offer among many RPGs, whether they be single titles or a franchise, with this game serving as a prime example of the former, regardless of reputation or legacy that have fortuitously stood the test of time. And for those that have missed out before now, consider yourself having done a shitty-ass disservice doing so. Until then, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God once again proudly signing off.
five motherfuckers! 